Hey folks, uh, today I just wanted to make a, a brief little video, and this is not super detailed, but just kind of an explanation as far as um, what beehive I prefer, why I use which one I use, and you know what might be best for you. Now, long story short, what's best for you is what works for you, what you like working with, and what fits your needs the best. Um, but I'm making this video uh, for my be my sister's father-in-law, who apparently is doing a little bit of thinking about getting some bees, which of course I encourage, but anyway. So behind me here is my original top bar hive. And when I first got into beekeeping and was thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to approach it, the top bar hive from everything I read was, was exactly what I wanted to do. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's effective. Now, it's effective in a sense of as a hobbyist beekeeper, you just want to have one or two colonies, you're not really interested in the honey that much, you're not really interested in doing anything beyond just having some bees in your backyard for pollinators, we'll say. The top bar hive is great. It works wonderful for that. Um, but a few of the challenges that you need to be aware of as a beginner is you're starting this hive um, foundationless and without a guide. So there is a very real probability, it happened to me and it's happened to a lot of people I've talked to, that you put your bees in this hive and they don't pull their combs in nice straight rows along the frames like you want them, or along the bars like you want them to, they pull them crossways. They'll pull them, you know, mine, they pulled um, about 15 degrees off center. So every comb they pulled crossed three bars. And as a beginner beekeeper, that can be very frustrating because in your mind, every ounce of work that those bees have done is precious and you don't dare destroy their work so you find yourself conflicted you don't want to cut those combs apart you don't want to you know fix what they did wrong but you need to and i've had a lot of people more than you would think call me and say i need help with my top bar hive because i don't want to get in there and mess up what they did i don't want to destroy their hard work and i tell these people time and time again you have to you, this this is something you have to deal with if you don't, it gets worse and worse and worse. And I, I've been there. I was in that exact same position. So that's challenge number one, is making sure they pull straight combs. Once they get a couple straight combs, it's easy. You just move a new bar in between two straight combs and they'll just fill it in. You know, they want to maintain that proper bee space, so they're going to draw parallel combs. But it's that getting started that can be chancy. Uh, the other big challenge, uh, as far as the hive itself, is you're limited on length. So you see the hive here, you know, it's only... It's only so long. Once they fill that length, that's it. They're out of space. So if you accidentally build your hive too short, then you find yourself in a situation where you need to make a split, or you need to harvest honey, or you need to do something to try to give them some more space in order to prevent swarming. My first year beekeeping in this exact hive, in the first two months, they filled it completely full. And I found myself in that situation. Now, I did enough reading. I you know, took action as quick as I could. I made a, what they call a cutback split or a queenless split, and I forced this hive into an emergency situation so they pulled queen cells, and then from that I actually made three splits. So I went from one hive to four after two months, which was, you know, exceptional success, and I managed to carry all those hives through the winter, which was even more amazing, but I managed to. Um, but, again, that was what I had to do to maintain the rapid growth of that hive because they outgrew this box. You can't just slap a second story on. I've seen some creative ideas. I've seen how people will, um, you know, they'll build us a, a box that'll sit on top and they'll drill some holes or do whatever they have to do to give them some more space. But the fact is, now you're removing that simplicity aspect. People always sell the top bar hive on basic, natural, and simple. And as soon as you start complicating that by trying to find ways to give them more space and trying to find ways to fix problems, now you've removed that aspect of simplicity. So keep that in mind. Understand what it is you want to do. The third thing um, would be the lack of foundation. So every comb inside this hive is pulled along the top bar, and that's all it is. It is a natural comb, which it's a beautiful thing. It's great, um, but it becomes a problem when you go to harvest honey. I've seen, again, very creative ideas on how people will strap one of these top bars into you know, some sort of wire basket and then put it inside their, their Langstroth extractor. Um, again, adding a lot of difficulty to solve a problem that's supposed to be supposed to be a simple hive. Um, typically what you have to do is just crush it by hand. Just cut out the comb and you know just 
brush and strain. And that works, that's effective. You get honey all over your hands, which of course, you know, that's nice. Um, but you also removed a lot of work. So when we go back to what I discussed earlier, you know, every bit of work those bees did is precious. All that comb that you cut out, all that beeswax, all that they built, they're not gonna take that back. They'll take the honey, they'll clean up any honey off the cappings and crush comb that you put back out, but they're not gonna take that wax. Now you can use that wax, you can melt it down, make candles, lotions, lip balms, whatever you wanna do. But just keep in mind, you can't, uh, you know, the bees aren't gonna rob that back. Not like you would think they would. I tried, again, I tried. You know, I'm speaking now from two and a half years experience and I'm not saying I'm a pro, I'm not saying I'm a professional by any means, but just, I want y'all to listen and, you know, kind of take my word for it. Now, I've kind of pointed out the negatives of the hive and I don't want you to tread on that or, you know, think that I'm trying to tell, sell you against these hives because again, I've kept this one. This was my original hive and I've kept it now for, yeah, I mean, two and a half years. And uh, I don't do a whole lot with it. It's mostly, at this point, it's mostly just a garden hive. I just leave it. I, I don't even take the honey. It's just, they're just a, a beehive. Um, I check in on them maybe a couple times a year, which that is not good beekeeping practice per se. Um, but it's what I have time to do, and I found that they're great bees. You know, I let them do their thing every year. Um, and it works for me. But from my position what I've transitioned to is I do a lot more from what you guys have seen with the removals and selling hives and all that stuff I do a lot more work in that aspect and from that point Langstrauss is the way to go you can't do that sort of work with top bar hives I've heard of a few people that do things um, that they're they're semi you know sub commercial with top bar hives and how they have the time and how they have the processes I don't know they figured it out I haven't um, and you know more power to them but again I am publishing this towards the the curiosity um, the potential first-time beekeeper that you know has read a little bit about everything it's not sure which way they want to go so I just want to point out those very real uh, risks the crooked combs the lack of space and the challenges when it comes time to um, harvest honey I guess the fourth thing I would want to point out is the challenges with respect to um, uh, accessories, okay? Top bar hives, there's no universal dimension. There's no set dimensions. There's no, uh, you know, catalog out there that has everything for your top bar hive. You can find plans online, and you can find several variations of several different plans. Um, and what that results in, or, you know, the reason that happens is, of course, because top bar hives, you build it how you want to build it. Uh, it's, it's completely up to you how long, how deep, how wide, uh, everything about that, it, it's up to you. So find a set of plans that might work, uh, and that's what I did with this first one. I followed a set of plans that I found. They were you know, super easy, lots of pictures, good plans. Um, but I'll be straight up with you, when I built three more top bar hives to make those splits, I got lazy and I got careless. I ended up with four hives, three of which were different dimensions. And when it came time to make those splits and move bars and move combs around between the different hives, I was in trouble. I find myself out here with a knife, shaving off edges of the comb, cutting this, bending that, doing whatever I could to make it all work. And again, now you run into a problem. You run into, uh, you're having to make exceptions, so to speak. You're having to make things more difficult that were supposed to be easy. So, um, and when I mention the accessories, what I mean is when it comes time, you know, when it comes to feeders, when it comes to traps, when it comes to anything like that that you might want to do in the future to help your bees you're going to have a problem. On, on mine, on the uh, far end of it there, uh, towards the picket fence, I had to build a little special box to go on the front because the plans I had just showed three round holes. Well, I wanted to be able to put a Borbman feeder on there if I needed to. So I built a little special front porch box for them. Well, here, let me, I'll just take you over there and show you. I built this little front porch box and I did this only so I could put a Borbman feeder on there. Um, yeah. Bear with me. I got my camera on a funny, but there you go. Y'all can see it. So see, I had to make that little box, and you can see there's a couple bees on the front porch there. But what these have actually started doing is they've started going in behind the um, the observation cover here because the glass popped out. That's a whole different story. That was shoddy craftsmanship on my part, not the fault of the hive. But I had to build that special um, porch, that special front piece for them, just so that it would work for me to put a bourbon feeder on there. So again. Um, 
you know, and that's very basic absorbent feeder. You can don't expect to put a Miller type feeder or any other type of top feeder on this thing. It's not going to work unless you cut slots and again make exceptions. Um, frame feeders not going to fit. Pollen traps. You can find, I think you can find some front mounting pollen traps that would work, but you'd have to modify it to make it fit on your top bar hive. So, a couple things, just keep it in mind. Um, and now I'll talk to you about the Langstroth hive and why, of course, I prefer this. You guys probably know by now, but why I prefer it. So, let's go look at some So, now let's talk about the Langstroth hive a little bit. And uh, got my co pilot with me because he woke up from his nap, so I'll have to try to make this a little bit quicker. But everything you see behind me, in the yard here. These are all Langstroth hives of various uh, colors and shapes and sizes, um, but conceptually all the same. Inside each box has, um, depending on the width, five to ten frames, but inside each box has frames. Each frame has foundation or is natural comb uh, pulled and, and built by the bees. Uh, but the reason I, I make this comparison, and, and most of you know, I typically run all Langstroths now. And that's what, of course, is the most common. That's what you're going to find with almost every beekeeper. Any commercial beekeeper you talk to is probably going to tell you you should run Langstroth. And, you know, to be honest with you, the only setback I've found so far is the cost of buying the equipment retail. And really, when I was first looking at getting into beekeeping, that was, that was my only challenge. That was my only problem was that, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm looking at this as a hobby, uh, not wanting to sink a whole lot of cash into it, and I get a catalog and I start looking at everything in there. I'm like, crap, it's so expensive. A box is 50 bucks, you know, the frames and the foundation. It's three dollars a piece, or you know, what have you. And I started adding all up. Oh, beginner's kit. That's only 400 dollars. Comes with everything you need, right? Well, I'm cheap and probably a little bit too practical. Um, so the the numbers to me were just overwhelming. The top bar hive that I was showing you guys a minute ago, I built that with scraps out of the garage, and that was a beautiful thing to me. Even the piece of glass for the observation window was a free piece of glass that I got. Um, but after having the top bar hive for, you know, a few months, I very quickly found that for what I was wanting to do with beekeeping as far as running a lot more colonies and starting to do removals and making splits and selling hives and everything else, the top bar hive just wasn't conducive. Um, from an industry support standpoint, you can't go wrong with Langstroth hives. It's been the industry standard for 150, 200 years. That's what everybody's running. Um, so when it comes to accessories, add-ons, components, um, anything you could think of, you can find it for a Langstroth hive. Um, just a couple things I have on my hives out here, which well, I guess really the only accessory that I have is on one of my hives, I have a pollen trap. Uh, and that's so I can harvest pollen off the bees when they bring it in. You know, it's, it's a good thing to have. You have a little jar of pollen in the freezer. But... Um, top feeders I guess actually yeah I do have a feeder on one of the hives um, so uh, you know top feeders Borman feeders um, pollen traps internal feeders the frame feeders I think they call them a division board feeder which doesn't really make any sense to me I call it a frame feeder um, queen excluders beetle traps all that sort of stuff it's uh, screen bottom boards that stuff is all geared and oriented towards Langstroth hive um, from a cost standpoint Find yourself a good set of plans. You can get on bsource.com. They have a download a PDF, a DIY section, and you can find a blown up, exploded view of a Langstroth hive with all the universal dimensions. And I build all my own equipment very, very affordably. Yes, it takes a little bit of extra time, uh, but I enjoy doing it. So, you know, like I said, when I when I first looked into it, when I first got into beekeeping, um, you know, top bar hive I thought was the only way to go because it seemed so cheap and so affordable. Um, but I very quickly found that Langstroth Hive was the way to go. So, just to try to wrap it up, um, you know, again, do what works best for you. Do what you want to do, what you think is best. I don't want to discourage you from trying a top bar hive if it's something you think would be fun. Um, but I will warn you, you need to do your homework first. You need to read, read, read. You need to understand the challenges like what I mentioned and any other challenges that might come up along the way. You need to know what can go wrong before you get into it and of course that's that kind of goes with anything that goes with any hobby any sort of task you want to take on you should kind of anticipate what could possibly go wrong um but with the top bar hive just make sure you don't get sold on the beauty of uh, it's natural you know and it's more basic and and all that jazz it is sure but just be advised that if you ever try to go beyond that try to do any more with it you're going to find yourself very quickly um, deviating from those natural 
and simplistic aspects. And you'll find yourself making exceptions, trying to do things to make it work better. So, um, you know, I can work either one. You call me and you ask questions. Of course, I always tell people, uh, you know, if you're going to call me and ask me for advice on your beehive, you better have done an inspection, okay? Don't call me and just tell me that it looks like there's a little less activity on the board. That doesn't do me any good. The best thing you can do is just do an inspection, pull every single frame, and write down what you see on that frame. And since each frame is double-sided, I would tell you do it in terms of 20s. If you have a 10-frame box, do it in terms of 20s. So what did you see on one half of each frame? Did you see 50% brood? Did you see 90% brood? Did you see 50% pollen? Was it 100% honey? Take, take notes and document all that and then put it all together at the end on how much of each item is actually in your hive. When it's all said and done, what's the hive? Uh, you know, 60% honey and 40% brood and 0% pollen. So that's a problem, you know. Uh, was it 10% pollen, 70% honey, and uh, I don't know, 20% brood? Going into winter, that might be okay. Um, if the weather's already started cooling off, you know, and the queen's already started cutting back. So, uh, honey, of course, is always a good thing to see going into the winter, but let me not detract from the point of this video. I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the common um, problems you can run into with a top bar hive and with a Langstroth hive. I don't think I really covered many of the problems with Langstroth hives except in the cost. Um, but there are some so just you know make sure you do your homework and uh, do what's best for you so for those of you thinking about getting into beekeeping and not sure which way you want to go with it i hope this helps please let me know if you have questions and i'll try my best to answer them as quickly as possible